is The Chris Abraham Show. Welcome to the Chris Abraham Show. This is Season 5, Episode 35. Uh, Today's episode is that uh, all Republicans are not alike, and the only Republican... Well, there's two Republicans? Um, Oh no, I'm going to completely forget how to pronounce the name of the uh, Indian American Republican... uh, Rinuswami, Rinuswami. But I'm basically going to kind of talk about the whole, like, thing about the difference between establishment Republicans or, you know, grand old party people, which I would like to define as neocons, compare and contrast with... uh, why Trump is such a popular candidate, no matter what he do, no matter what he does, and that all comes down to populism, right? Populism and nationalism. It's very important to realize that Trump is appealing not to Christian conservatives or fiscal conservatives or small government conservatives or even uh, pro-life conservatives. He's not appealing to uh, less tax conservatives. Um, He is appealing right now to uh, jingoistic and xenophobic Americans. He hasn't displeased two-way gun rights or freedom of speech Americans. But uh, he is not a Republican. He's only a Republican running on the, as far as running on the Republican ticket. I mean, he's a Manhattan billionaire, right? Manhattan billionaires are traditionally, from as long as I've lived, socially liberal, fiscally conservative, right? Just everybody... In Manhattan is socially liberal, fiscally conservative. What Trump is selling as, and nobody else is, is uh, the populist angle. And Trump has more in common with RFK Jr. than he has with Mike Pence or or uh, Ron DeSantis or or uh, um, or any of the other. Republican nominees. This came out in relief, in strong relief, uh, during the Blaze slash Freedom Liberty Conference or whatever happened, whatever it was called. This became in, in, in harsh relief when Tucker Carlson interviewed all of the nominees for Republican president. And each one of them shared more international politics with the neo-libs in terms of exporting democracy, in terms of mindless support for uh, the war in Ukraine towards infinite uh, budget for uh, weapons of mass destruction, towards being willing to dance with the threat of nuclear annihilation, towards uh, ignoring our city streets or our border and saying, look over there, Russia bad. And all these old men, even these young women uh, who are part of the establishment GOP, 
our establishment. They're, they're in line with the alphabet agencies. They have no conflict with Department of Justice. They have no conflict with State Department. They have no conflict with Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, and Space Force. Uh, they are in support of NATO. They're in support of American adventurism. They can look at the camera with a straight face and say that we are invading sovereign countries for democracy and to save uh, um, moms, pregnant people, and babies. And no matter what Tucker said to each one of these people in order to give them an out, they doubled down. Ukraine needs our support. We need to defang Russia. Russia is imperialist. Russia's, we need to protect Western Europe and Eastern Europe from um, an adventurous Putin who really, outside of, you know, I mean, in the last 40 years, we both, well, in the last 50 years, we both have invaded Afghanistan. So that's kind of a wash, right? We both have fought the Mujahideen. Uh, we both have intervened in, other, in each other's uh, invasion of Afghanistan. And we've also both been driven out of Afghanistan by a strong tribal desire not to have uh, an imperial force in a tribal Muslim country. So we share that, so that's sort of a wash. And then you've got Syria, but one might argue that even though uh, their participation and their helping in support of Assad is counter to our agenda, which is to topple Assad, uh, one might say that they were invited there. They didn't invade there. So that's not invasion. Um, there's, of course, I think the Chechnyan conflict and of course, uh, Crimea, Crimea, Crime, Crimea River, um, which is an ethnically Russian uh, city or an ethnically Russian region. And then, really, honestly, uh, the two requests, like I said, with regards to the rattlesnake rattle uh, that uh, Putin had over the last 40 years is do not uh, run NATO past Eastern Germany. And then we kind of rolled past that. And like I said, we've uh, used uh, extreme hearts and minds warfare and monetary leverage. And uh, the fact that when the Soviet Union crumpled, uh, all those former Soviet bloc countries were completely poor and we came with lots of money and promises. And whether or not that's their long game, because I dare say that uh, if you are being, if you are following money, you only follow that money as long as the money is to be followed. Um, I don't believe necessarily that all these democratic Eastern states who during interviews said that their lives were better under communism because, you know, Old people had things to do, young people had things to do. There was an expectation of, um, uh, what is it called? Um, an expectation of patriotism, an expectation, uh, an expectation of communism. Uh, there was uh, a definite communist assimilation going on. There was no identity politics, right? Like in communism, the only identity is the state. So if you don't assimilate, you go to re-education camp. Um, anyway, so I believe that those Eastern European countries are fair with their friends. Just like most of our allies with most countries in the Middle East. As long as the money flows and as long as it makes sense, their alliance is with not democracy... It's with the family, it's with the tribe, it's with the religion, it's with the culture. There's no natural desire to love and support love is love. Um, so I'm coming upon 
a construction site, so this is going to be awful from now on. Um, so, based on that, if you check out the show notes, I'll show you the real big difference between uh, Trump, MAGA, MAGA Republican, and what a, uh, a neocon establishment Republican believes, and they're completely different. Um, MAGA Republican is nationalist. Uh, MAGA Republican is isolationist. MAGA Republican surely might be a little jingoistic and xenophobic, but that is part of the nationalism. It's tribal, not racial. Um, It's uh, based on the Constitution in their hearts. They've, they've, a lot of them be, have been police and firemen and uh, in the military and so forth, and they've pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And they've also pledged, you know, their uh, devotion as well to... Uh, you know, the Constitution, right? So that is really their Jesus Christ. That really is their Virgin Mary. That really is their G-D, right? That's their, their God is as materialistic. Uh, you know, the Constitution, even though, I mean, here's another thing. There's no assumption that Trumpies are against abortion. There's no guarantee that Trumpies have Jesus in their heart. There's no guarantee that uh, devoted Christians, Muslims, Jews who are conservative, not liberals, that they in any way, even if they vote for Trump, they're not doing it uh, because Trump has anything but lip service to a uh, higher power to say nothing of Christ Jesus or, or, uh, or Mohammed, peace be upon him, or, or Ganesh or Vishnu or, 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 or whomever. So you really need to realize it's also, like I said, isolationist. Um, what is called carrying water for Putin is actually a um, anti-war sentiment, not a pro-Putin, but an anti-war sentiment, insofar that uh, Trumpies wanted uh, soldiers to come home from Afghanistan and from Iraq and from Syria and wanted all that cash dollars, all that $800 billion dollars a year to go towards, you know, domestic investments. Um, they surely, I will say that while it seems like people like Mike Pence, who was completely demolished on that stage with Tucker, in spite of the fact that it might seem like they have a lot in common, it all goes differently when it comes to international relations. I'll uh, include a, uh, a blog post that I wrote back in the 2000s where I actually agreed with Pat Buchanan. Holy crap, Pat Buchanan is, is definitely a Trump Republican, right? Um, whether he's alive or dead, that mofo was sort of a proto-Trump Republican, right? He was very much against international investment, against uh, international NGOs, against, um, uh, um, you know, 800 military bases around the world. Um, his, his in-country, his domestic policy was pretty, you know, pretty... Yeah, definitely xenophobic, jingoistic. But his his international policy 
uh, was not, was the antithesis of saving pagan babies or exporting democracy at the tip of a sword or the tip of a spear, right? It's very important to realize that um, the whole concept of closed borders is not because America doesn't like brown people, but there is a concept of uh, locking down the estate, right? Locking down the estate. I mean, there are already, I mean, you know, 40% of the American population is easily, quote, brown people. There is a, a high diversity. It's not like, you know, it's not like 90%. Like back in the 50s, 90% of Americans were white. It was crazy. I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I have a friend who's a Trumpist, and he believes that there are terrorists flooding over the borders, or uh, we're only getting the criminals. People are emptying their prisons and sending their ex-cons or their actual convicts and murderers over the border. Let them be our problem. Their definition of what's happening with an open border is that... Um, America in the 16, 1700s, pre, see, we all talk about Australia being a, uh, a prison uh, colony, but a hundred years before that, America was the first prison colony. We received all the refuse, all the people who were rejected by society vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Statue of Liberty's poem. And that's what the Trumpist Republicans are accusing now, which is to say America's being treated like a prison colony of the world. They, instead of like the, the, the mythos of uh, black poor, white poor, brown poor, 17, 18, 19 year old criminals in the 60s being told by the judge, listen, you can choose jail or you can choose the nom. And so this concept of taking the, the um, unmentionables, the untouchables, uh, the um, uh, the criminal class and throwing them into the, um, what is it called? Um, meat grinder of Vietnam was mythically or actually a strategy going on. And it's anyway, right? Like, uh, killing young bucks is kind of what war is good for. Sorry, Ukraine, no more young bucks, only the awful intellectuals and the awful rich who are who had enough uh, uh, m uh, mind and sense to to leave Ukraine before the war started. Um, but yeah, so that is what the Trump Republicans believe is going on. They believe that uh, countries around the world have opened the doors of their prisons and said, "Here's a here's a first class ticket to." Coyote, where you are going to get to go to America and you are going to get to go live there instead of living in the prison here. And that is the uh, mythos going on in the Trump MAGA Republican world. So there's this belief that, uh, I mean, it partially has to do with sort of a, a mythic um, ideal memory of the uh, 50s, 60s, and maybe 70s and 80s in America, there is most certainly a desire to kind of return to a uh, an ideal capitalist utopia that never existed, as we say, because um, Asians, Latinos, Latinas, people of color, Eidos, Blacks, immigrants and so forth were not included in that. It was basically an I 
ideal world because they had um, a homogenous culture and there was a belief that it was highest common denominator as opposed to what they perceive today as a recalibration of American culture to an accepted and normalized lowest common denominator. That's what's going on. So, I don't know. This is completely different. Um, The MAGA Republicans don't care at all. I mean, like, uh, back to this, it's a populist idea, right? Which is why people who would never have voted for um, a... uh, And the reason why it's okay that Trump went ahead and had Roe v. Wade uh, overturned through his long-term, and, you know, he was being used for that, right? So for the last uh, 50 years, there's been a single-hearted goal, single-minded goal to overturn Roe v. Wade as bad law. Now, the reason why... Trump isn't getting any shit for that is because it uh, it goes back to a conservative concept of the constitutional republic with democracy that America has always been proud of, which is states' rights over federal rights. And so bad law, just to appease the public, should always be overturned, and each state should have its own uh, agency and its own democracy to represent the kind of pH balance of politics that each state wants to have. For example, the uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade did not affect at all blue states. It did not affect at all blue states. California, Oregon, Washington. It didn't affect New York. It didn't affect Massachusetts. It didn't affect New Jersey didn't affect Connecticut. Um, It didn't affect Chicago or Illinois. Uh, And so, one might say, that the overturning of Roe v. Wade didn't affect anybody who wanted it with enough, in enough numbers, that state and local and city and village law was democratically elected in such a way that those things were supported, right? So their argument is if you really wanted it, you would have, you would, you would live in a state or you would, um, democratically elect into office a government within your state that would allow full-term abortion or a more permissive abortion or a more permissive um, uh, uh, trans policy or a more, you know. So there's this concept in America that there is no thing as social justice, that social justice is an emergent manifestation of people voting for what they want and the um, como on dit, uh, the, uh, the, the manifestation of the world they want based on uh, voting and creating a world where the laws re- reflect the desires of the people who live there. Whereas social justice believes that there are, and they don't believe in God, but they believe that there is a universal law of justice and civility and goodness and and um, social justice that I don't think they just say democracy. Democracy is just a red herring word, but there's this idea of what a perfect utopian world looks like that I dare say that they don't even follow. Uh, it's more like do what I say, not what I do, because uh, the moment... Um, uh, you know, 65 year old, um, um, cisgender white faces enter that, uh, it doesn't make any sense anymore, but there is a, 
And, you know, I, I think that social justice is about control and power rather than it's a pure manifestation of goodliness. I do not believe that it has any root in goodliness. I believe that it is a... It is a way of checking to see whether or not you are or aren't. Um, you're either for us or against us, right? It's like uh, exactly like the 1950s playbook where um, if you were anything but a, uh, a Christian Republican, they would say... You know, um, love it or leave her, love her or leave her, love it or leave it. America, love it or leave it, right? And so it's that same kind of power strategy of love it or leave it, or, you know, anything that is not compliant with our power and control is Christo fascist, is fascist, and so forth. If I thought it was like, you know, my concept of Christ love, which is, um, compassion and love and, um, and uh, agape and if there was a real understanding and empathy and compassion and sympathy and if there was a real understanding and if you were to look into people's contexts and assume that hurt people hurt people and really get into the depth of the complexity of people, I would be like social justice isn't a command and control uh, hammer uh, and sickle or whatever, but I don't think it's nearly that innocent because I can see it playing out on the international field. There was a, an amazing New Yorker article years ago now that exposed about how little America cared at all about rural women and children. The only women and children who got um, Western educations are the uh, scion of the ruling class of Kabul. Um, the, if you'll notice, everybody was interviewed uh, on NPR and the BBC about their free schools and where women were um, educated in a Western way. If you dig it all, you'll find out that all those people were the children of, uh, of, of um, generals. So it was a cop-out. It was like, it was as if saying um, that all women deserve educations as long as they go to Harvard, Yale, Brown, uh, etc., right? As long as, they go to, as long as they go to Georgetown Day or, or Choate or whatever, as long as, you know, um, everybody else, you know, like, like public school, everybody else, fuck them, fuck them, uh, and so I don't believe social justice is remotely um, earnest. And while, like every, like every religion, the, so, the Church of Social Justice has earnest, loving, compassionate people who have Christly natures, have, have beautiful natures, who become social workers and help people find homes and so forth. However... I believe that, you know, just like every possibly corrupt uh, leader of every definitely corrupt uh, church, I believe that, you know, if you scratch the surface, as we found out from the BLM corruptions, uh, that everything's a grift, everything's a graft, and um, everything's a hustle, everything's a scheme. But, you know, like I always say, I mean, I think that Joel Osteen is pretty charismatic. But no matter how, no matter how corrupt the words, for example, um, we all know by now that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was a philanderer. He was a complete philanderer. The FBI had so much poop on him. It was pathetic. However, his words, his actions, his deeds in support and in service... Of, um, of, of segregation and um, of freedom and justice and equality and equity in uh, America's, you know, 1940s, 1950s white and black America um, was beyond reproach. We all know that Mother Teresa was a cunt, 
But that doesn't change the fact that Mother Teresa did God's work and influenced people every day. Um, so, you know, like I'm feeling like if, if, if even a, um, a, a super preacher par excellence or a, even a, you know, freaking um, snake charmer, evangelical wackadoodle is fleecing his, fleecing his, uh, his parishioners. If any of those people receive the word and receive the Holy Spirit or, you know, to change that into more uh, material terms, if, uh, if, the, if the goodness of social justice and love is love, and feel compassion towards the struggle of another, or as Philo of Alexandria or uh, Plato or Socrates or whoever said it, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. If that is something that someone finds through 12-step, whether that's a hustle, through therapy, even if that's a hustle, through a cult or through landmark or through Scientology or through Mormonism or Catholicism or Orthodoxy or Judaism or, or Islam, peace be upon them, or Hinduism or Shintoism or Buddhism or um, communism or socialism or anarchism or um, even capitalism, if you have learnings as a result, whether in conflict to that or whether in support of that or whether you were led to find words that touched your heart and your heart was touched by, you know, a higher power, if you will, and you change your life in a positive way, and if the scales came off your eyes, and if you found your own personal Jesus, and if you found a way of making a better world, and if you stopped being a sheep and became a shepherd, or at least became a sheep dog, or became a landowner or a ranch owner, uh, if you became softer, softer with people, if you became less impatient, if you became less resentful, if you became less hateable and hateful, if you had the chip knocked off your shoulder, if you, uh, have, if you were born again into a life of love and gentleness and kindness and selflessness and service, then amen to that. Uh, those people who live a degenerate life and, shh, and don't love the sheep, but shear them, raise them and shear them, like, um, uh, those people will have their day either in hell or up against the wall at some point. And on that note, I must get to work. I love you. I care about you. And I don't mind that you don't listen to this podcast. I wouldn't if I were you. Kisses and love. Happy Thursday. Today is 20 Thursday, July 2023. But I will post it on the 21st, which is uh, a day. Love you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.